stand and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll start out with the uh, minutes. Has everybody had a chance to review the minutes from our last meeting? There's so there a motion to receive those as presented. So moved. Second. There's a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. The next item is item three, the consent agenda. All items with an asterisk are considered to be routine by the city council and will be enacted on by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless the council of uh, uh, member Orson requests in which this uh, event or the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered separately in its normal sequence on the agenda. Is there any items that anyone would like to have to be removed? I have one item 7E to be removed. Is there a motion to uh, accept the, the consent agenda as presented with the exception of 7E? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. At this time, uh, before we get into our public hearings, I'm going to have uh, item 6A, uh, Dave Harmon from DLCC, to please come forward and give a presentation for us. Well, thanks. Uh, every year I come in and give kind of an annual report on uh, the DLCC summer rec programs. Um, and it's kind of nice to go first because I think I got all happy news for everybody. So um, I did hand out a handout. As you can see, our numbers, our summer rec programs are minor league baseball, major league baseball, little league baseball, girls softball, tennis. And then we run a very unique program over at Direct Building. When you look down these numbers, you can see um, they're pretty high numbers. And the good thing about what's happened in the last two years is that everything bounced back the same or even better numbers than we've had in the past. I've been doing this for 10 years in the city of DL, and uh, these are just fantastic numbers. Um, compared to some of the other programs that we have and that are going on right now and they're coming up, our numbers continue to grow. And um, I always have to give praise to the right people. And in this case, it's the parents in the city of DL. <coughs> we have a wonderful group of parents that get their kids involved, get them out, and have them play and have fun. So that makes my job a little easier. Um, we also have, uh, I think the last couple of years too, it's uh, good to say that with what happened that we seem to have a high number of volunteers. Parents want to be more involved, and that's moms and dads. So another good thing for me and for the city. And I know other cities that I talk to, they do not have the luxury of this parent involvement. So that is really awesome too. Um, there's some other uh, little summer programs that we also run for three and four year olds. We run a happy bat program where we had 25 to 30 kids. We run a t-ball <coughs> program that has always close to 100 kids. Um, and the reason I bring these up because these are great feeder programs for the rec programs and they're all run out at Snappy Park. Um, I always give you numbers about participation. <coughs> And I thought I'd mix it up a little bit different this year. If you take all the kids that participate and all the adults that come watch the kids play, in one week out at Snappy Park where we have games on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night, <coughs> and we also have adult softball, that's approximately 1,700 people come to Snappy Park weekly. That number right there is just astonishing. When you think that we have... 10 weeks of games out there, you can do the, do the math. And that is really amazing. Um, we do have some adult programs that we run. Uh, men's softball, women's softball, uh, co-ed softball. Men and co-ed is very strong, but in the whole state and actually the Midwest, softball is on a decline. 
and our women's softball is actually on a decline. And the main reason being is the younger generation just did not play slow pitch softball. When you come out and watch them play, you'll see it'll be an age group of 35 plus. Um, it used to be 20, 30 years ago, there would be two or three teams that were 25 years and younger. We just do not have that anymore. Um, that's the difference between the men's and the co-ed. Uh, they have a lot younger participation. <coughs> um, the other thing I, I always like to say is that uh, um, Snappy Park is just a wonderful facility. And um, kudos to the city, the public works, our parks and rec department, administration. I really work well with them side by side. So this is not just a DLCC program. This is a city and DLCCC. And it's just been a marvelous relationship. Um, and then the other thing I want to bring up is that if you ever drive by the new pickleball courts, um, you can tell from 8 o'clock until 12 o'clock, boy, those courts are really busy and flying. And uh, it's, it's just a great recreational for all ages. And that continues to grow. Uh, the schools are starting to bring kids over there and doing uh, PE classes and everything. So um, it's just great. I have nothing but good things to say about the summer programs right now. They're growing. Great participation with kids and parents. So any questions? Can we have any questions for Dave? If not, Dave, thank you very much for the great job that you do for the City of Detroit Lakes. We appreciate all your efforts. Thank well, you very thank much. Thank you. It's an honor. At this time, we're going to go to item 7B. I'm going to have Greta from the library to please come forward and, and give us an update of uh, what, what she has uh, going on over there at the library. And uh, we're we're going to have a consideration of approving the architect proposal for a library improvement. But before we go into that, we're going to have Greta just tell us what she's got planned for us. Uh, certainly. So this is a proposal from BHH uh, Architects. And um, our community needs assessment, which was done this past year, uh, resoundingly the number one priority was to, to do something about the public bathrooms, to renovate the public bathrooms. Um, this would, would entail um, updating them to ADA compliant so that they are ADA compliant. And then also um, uh, updating the lighting, updating the fixtures, just bringing them. They were uh, built in 1989, and so they just need an overall update, but then also the issue of ADA compliance is of utmost importance. Um, so this would be the first step uh, in, in uh, moving towards renovating the public bathrooms. Um, I also, there is a, a potential donor towards this project, so hopefully if we are able to uh, move this forward, um, this is a project that we can see see through to fruition, and then I think we'll have a, a celebration and, and the, the public library visitors, and I think a lot of people would be very excited about this. Um, I, I've been the library director for about two years and seven months, and no joke, within the first month of taking over, this was the number one thing that I heard. <laughs> the public bathrooms. <laughs> Which, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer, but that is the proposal I am asking you to consider. Any questions for Greta? If not Greta, you've got a great library going there, you've got a great staff, and we appreciate all that you do for us. And. Uh, you, I know you've got a working uh, community needs uh, uh, program going to come up with ideas for us and uh, we appreciate you coming here and letting us know what those ideas are. But most of all, we appreciate all the work that you do for our library. You've made a big difference for us. Well, thank you. At this time, I'm gonna call on Natalie. So the Finance Committee discussed this and moves to make the consideration to approving the architect proposal for the library improvements. We have a motion, is there a second? Second. There is a second. Uh, any discussion on this? And the actual dollar amount looks like uh, 5900 That's correct. Is that correct. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, like she said, uh, we, we, we have a possible, uh, looked like a real good uh, donor coming forward on this, so we're very fortunate for that, too. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, we'll all take a vote. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. Okay, now. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Greta, for coming. Now we're going to go back to, uh, to our regular agenda, and, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to adjourn our regular uh, meeting for a public hearing, and we're going to start out with 4A, a public hearing to receive public comments on the proposed street and utility improvements for Westlake Drive, uh, County State Highway 6 to the Pelican River. Uh, John, would you like to give us an update on that? Certainly. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Council. Uh, before I start, just so I can engage the audience a little bit, who's here for this particular hearing? Quite a few, of, I imagine. Okay, good turnout. Um, so we're going to go through a bunch of material for a lot of you folks. Uh, a lot of this will just be repeat from previous meetings we've had, maybe some updates and new information as well. So I will try to cover it all again. Uh, public hearing for Westlake Drive, County Road 6 to the Pelican River. Oh, yeah? That helps. I think you told me to do that, didn't you? There we go. So overview and purpose. Again, this is for the proposed street and utility reconstruction to Westlake Drive uh, between the Pelican River and County Road 6. Why? A number of reasons. Gain input, provide information, answer questions uh, from the public or from the council. And that's also a requirement of Minnesota Statute 429 because we'll be using some special assessments to fund a portion of the project. So I'll go over the existing conditions and the project need. Uh, we'll touch on what the proposed improvements are going to consist of or what we're looking at right now. Uh, estimated costs, funding, special assessments, which is, of course, what a lot of people are interested in, interested in. And then we'll talk a little bit about the schedule and have time for questions and comments uh, following the presentation. So again, here's the project location between the river and County Road 6 on Westlake Drive. Uh, Background, this actually goes back a fair distance. Um, I think it goes back more than five years, but formally about five years ago, uh, there was a number of folks along there that ultimately requested that the city start examining ways to improve, really at that point, the sanitary sewer. And that's where that started in about 2017. Uh, we actually started looking at trail options as far back as 2009. So this thing has a little bit of history to it. Uh, we held a number of public input meetings, uh, more informal type meetings, uh, 17, 18. Um, at that time, we kind of came out that there was some, some uh, interest in doing more than just the sewer, uh, rip the Band-Aid off, if you will, and get all the improvements done that need to be done. Uh, we did an additional meeting in August where we talked a little bit more specifically about the trail alignment. So we've visited on this for a number of years. Over that time, this project scope has grown. Again, starting with the sanitary sewer, uh, then we added in you know, a full reconstruction of the street rather than just replacing half of the street for the sewer. Uh, street reconstruction necessitates us to do stormwater collection and treatment in accordance with um, current regulations. And then we also have added the water main uh, reconstruction as well. We'll touch on that in a little bit. So this is also a joint project with Becker County. They're the road authority uh, for the project. So. A uh, recent, couple other recent developments. Uh, the county received a grant from SHIP to further study some of the trail alignment options. That's what we covered at the August meeting. Uh, we got basically two options for that, the east side or the lake side of the, pro of the roadway or the west or railroad side of the project. Uh, also, the city received a $150,000 grant. Uh, I think that was this spring from the DNR to go for a uh, portion of the trail construction costs. So existing conditions, there is no conventional gravity sewer in this area. And what I mean by conventional is typically a sewer system within a municipality consists of uh, a, a gravity main and the, and the homes flow to that via gravity um, and then goes to a lift station after that where it continues on down the line. That's not what exists here. Uh, the existing sewer, if you will, is a six inch PVC force main. So you have a pressurized pipe that's sort of quasi serving as the sewer collection. Uh, it was installed in the late 70s. Uh, it really, the primary purpose of that main that's out there is to convey 
uh, the discharge from upstream lift stations at Shorewood Drive, Weefest area, River Hills, et cetera. So that's carrying and pumping uh, that effluent into the city, getting it towards the wastewater treatment plant. So some speculation is that this was never designed for this, um, but very, very small lots. They probably had septic systems on them at one point and you can quickly run out of space for septics on those size lots. So I, again, some speculation that as those failed, the next best option was, well, let's just pump into the force main, which can be done, but has its challenges, which most of you have probably experienced or a good portion of you. Um, you know, and when there were seasonal cabins, it was probably a little bit easier. As time's gone on, those have become more full-time uh, homes. So that's sort of the evolution of this. Um, so the properties right now pump sewage into the forest main and basically you have a septic tank with a pump, pumps into there, there's a check valve that's supposed to keep the stuff in the forest main, in the forest main, therein lies the issue. Those check valves fail and the stuff that's supposed to stay inside the forest main ends up in yards and things like that. So um, I won't dive into that any further. So those are all private systems. but. We've had a number of backups over the year. It's kind of like clockwork, at least two or three a year, I would say, over the course of time. So water main, uh, there's an existing six inch water main uh, it installed in the 70s when that force main was installed. Um, really, I, I can't say that it's in poor condition. It's a PVC water main, but it's a different type of material than what's currently used. So it's not up to date, if you will. Uh, and then more recently, the Public Utilities Commission did a water distribution master plan and one of the uh, things that fell out of that study was the need to upsize this water main going around that side of the lake. It is one of two water mains really going to the south side of the lake. The one around the other side is, is a good sized main, but this one is, is quite a bit too small uh, to do what it needs to be doing. Street, uh, right now it's a 44 foot wide rural section, plus or minus, no curb and gutter. Um, it was originally graded or constructed back when it was a MnDOT road where Highway 59, uh, best we can tell in about 1950. Um, then there's been typical rehab and maintenance since then. Um, I updated this and didn't send it to Kerry. I think it was in uh, 50 something, the surface was added, and then it was overlaid in 70 something, uh, and then overlaid and widened to its current width. Um, I believe in 2000 or 90 something. So it's point being, you're going back to the 50s is when that was originally graded. And since then it's basically been overlaid and sort of maintained. Um, I wouldn't say it's the worst road in town, but it certainly has its deficiencies. It's starting to show its age a little bit. Um, there's some cracking. Again, I wouldn't say it's awful, uh, but with the other improvements, obviously that's gonna have to be removed in order to just to facilitate those improvements. Stormwater, there is no storm, water or storm sewer collection or treatment system right now. Basically, drainage is just provided by a ditch system on the west side of the roadway. There's really nothing on the east side to speak of. Um, there's some nuisance ponding that happens occasionally. Again, I can't point to that and say that it's necessarily a, a huge issue, but there is no formal drainage system to either convey or treat the stormwater um, through the segment. So, proposed improvements, uh, sanitary sewer. Again, through a course of meetings or different options were presented, the one that fell out was basically to install a, what I would call a conventional uh, gravity collection system. So we'll put a gravity main in through this area. Uh, it will all flow to a common point somewhere in the middle of the segment, go into a small lift station. That lift station will either pump back into the existing force main or will run another force main down to where the adjacent gravity system ends, which is just on the other side of County Road 6. So one of those two options, but in either case, you'll have the ability to discharge to a gravity system without pushing against any sort of pressure. This is just a picture of it, obviously, a little tough to see. Water main, <coughs> uh, what we're proposing there is a 12 inch water main that we would place through the whole project section. Uh, we would remove the existing water main that's there. We don't need two things doing the same thing. That's two things to maintain over time. So we would remove that, put a new 12 inch main, put new service laterals in, new hydrants, new valves, et cetera. The existing main is 45 years old. So while I can't say again that it's specifically deficient, it's 45 years old. Um, so it would be, I don't think it would be wise was the 
the, the logic to go put street improvements over the top of a 45-year-old water main. Um, we'd hate to be back there in 10 years ripping up the street just to replace a water main that we didn't do. Um, service laterals. Um, typically what we do on these reconstruction projects is the city extends the service laterals from the sewer or the water main out to the edge of the property or the edge of the right-of-way and we stop. We put a curb stop in or we put a clean out on and connect to what's there. Um, there is a thought and we haven't really vetted this out yet and I've mentioned this before that it would make a lot of sense to sort of complete the job on the property owner side of things, meaning get rid of your pumps, go that extra 10 feet to get rid of the tanks and the pumps and make that connection. A, doing it under one large project should, should afford some savings. Biggest thing is then each property owner isn't looking to have to bring a contractor in to dewater this thing. We'll have the whole site dewatered for the rest of it. It makes sense to take advantage of that. And so we could either go down the path of telling everybody, okay, here's your month window, you coordinate it, or we do it. Or potentially it could be a combination. If folks want to do that on their own and we state the window that you have to do that, we could go down that road, or we could just take it under contract. Um, there's some details that would have to be worked out uh, from a legal perspective, I think, for us to do that. We would need some temporary easements and agreements, but I think it makes some sense. So that's something that yet to be flushed out. Uh, it require a little bit more work on our end because every one of those situations is gonna be a little bit different. So, um, more to come. Street, uh, right now what we're looking at is something that's 30 to 32 feet wide, urban section, curb and gutter. Uh, it's very similar to the other portion of Westlake Drive um, to the north um, that we're also planning to do next year. Uh, it is substantially narrow than, narrower than the existing road. We're basically giving up most of those shoulders. Um, right now it's again 44 feet wide. Uh, we would be looking at shifting the alignment to the west, particularly at the north end of the project. As you go south, it starts to come back onto its existing alignment a little bit more. Uh, that'll improve the separation from the homes and additional length of driveways. Right now, everybody's aware that that proximity or that road is very, very close to a lot of the homes, particularly down by County Road 6. Uh, we are looking at doing on-street parking on, on one side of the road. Right now, we're recommending the west side of the road simply because um, we don't have issues with <coughs> cars park where there's driveway approaches and things like that. Uh, if we try to go to the other side, you're actually going to limit how much parking capacity you're going to have just by purely by the number of driveway openings. So the west side seems to make some sense. Storm water, uh, we will have to put in a small um, storm sewer system. So essentially runoff will go to the curb and gutter, into some inlets, into a storm sewer. That storm sewer will discharge probably to the west side of the road, either to a a small basin that we would have to construct or to some swales in the ditch, things of that <coughs> nature. Uh, but we do have to treat to current regulations um, when we're reconstructing this road to meet uh, both watershed and city requirements. Walt well, use Trail, we're looking at a 10 foot wide concrete surface, a five foot turf or colored and stamped concrete boulevard. I don't know that we've nailed that down. Um, I think Personally, if we can get away with a, a five-foot turf boulevard, that'd probably be nice. Um, the concrete makes it feel a little bit different. And with five feet, I, I feel reasonably comfortable that we'd get some turf to grow. That can be a challenge, is getting turf to grow on those boulevards. But uh, at five feet, I think we can do it. Um, and again, we can place that trail on either the west side or the east side. There are absolutely pros and cons. Uh, to both. You can make a, a, a good argument for both options. You know, on the eastern alignment, um, certainly this is from my perspective, but we've spent a lot of time looking at this. You know, the pros to an eastern alignment, we're not crossing Westlake Drive at County Road 6, and obviously that's, that's a big one. Uh, it's pretty similar to the existing situation with pedestrians using the shoulder, at least on that side. Uh, it's better connection at the Dutton Locks Trail. There's better continuity and user experience for people using the trail, meaning the trail is going to be on that east side from six to Legion. So you kind of can just keep on going. Uh, that's an important factor. Um, it's also better for any sort of future trail extension. While we have nothing planned uh, formally, um, someday it is certainly possible that the trail keeps going around the lake. 
And if we go to that west side, you'd ultimately be crossing back once you get to Long Bridge Road. So keeping it on this side potentially avoids another crossing uh, in the future. Longer driveways, more separation between the street and the homes under this option. Um, cons, obviously the big con is crossing all the driveways. It's a lot. Um, and then just the proximity of the trails to the homes. I mean, that is understandable if we live along there that there would be some desire or preference to have it on the other side, simply to have that over on the other side of the road. So not much to look at here. I probably could have left these out. Looking at the western alignment, the obvious pro, there's basically one driveway to cross um, and some other unused approaches, I would say. Um, and then proximity to homes. It puts it on the other side for most of the folks out there. Um, cons, the big one, crossing Westlake Drive. It's a larger safety risk. And when I say that, we evaluated this, this risk of both are not great. You're crossing a lot of driveways or you're crossing a busy roadway. But just simply put, statistically speaking, there's much more opportunity for a vehicle and pedestrian interaction when you're crossing Westlake Drive, purely by volume. So that's how we've kind of landed on that. Not to mention the driveways also are at a lower speed. So you bundle all that together, this, you know, this becomes a larger risk. Uh, potentially, we would need to add stop control uh, to facilitate that crossing. Um, bikes and peds might still continue to use the shoulder if they just say, eh, I'm not stopping. <coughs> There's folks that run that don't like to stop to cross the road, so they'll just keep on going, and that sort of defeats the purpose. Uh, we need a permitted easement at County Road 6 from that property owner. Um, we'd also need additional temporary easement um, from private property and railroad under that scenario. So quite simply, the recommendation from city and county staff is to, <laughs> I have that wrong. <laughs> Eastern alignment is recommended. Wow, uh, let me be clear. Eastern alignment is the recommendation uh, from the city and county staff on this. And again, the primary reasons are the functionality, the safety, and then future considerations. So that's where we've landed. Um, construction challenges and impacts. We'll get into this as we move closer to the project. Um, there's a lot of items that I, I don't have good answers for at this point. Um, we will detour the through traffic, so you won't have all the traffic trying to come through a construction zone. We will try to have local access to the degree we absolutely can. We'll spend a lot of time trying to figure out, stage the project such that it keeps that access open to the degree we can. Uh, but it will be challenging at times. Um, on the other segment of, of Westlake Drive, we're looking at doing half the roadway at a time and using that other unoccupied half to get cars in and out, meaning the folks that live along there. So we may end up doing something similar to that. Uh, there'll be a lot of communication leading up to the construction and during through you know, progress meetings or more input meetings if needed. Um, email blasts and newsletters are commonly stuff that we do during construction in, an, in addition to just interaction face to face. Uh, the city will put stuff on their website and things like that. One thing I do wanna point out as we get further into the design, we may need some temporary easements from properties in order to facilitate this design in so we can make sure we tie driveways back into the new roadway properly. If we don't have enough space to do that, it can result in abrupt changes, so we might need to go back on your driveway five feet or something and replace it out. So more to come. Schedule, uh, assuming the council and the county move ahead with this, we do the final design uh, this winter, um, moving towards a bidding sometime in the spring of 22 with an assessment hearing also next spring. Uh, awarding a construction contract sometime in that April or, or May time frame, uh, and then moving into construction next year. So right now, I, I think there's a, a hope or a goal, and I can't commit to this, that we would actually <coughs> bid this segment of Westlake Drive and the other segment of Westlake Drive at the same time, like same day, with a bit of a hope that we get the same contractor to do both. Uh, that would help with the coordination between the two and make life just a little bit easier. So. We'll see, have to see how that plays out. So estimated project costs, and I gotta ask, emphasize they're estimated yet. Um, we're still working off of you know, fairly simplistic drawings. As we get closer and closer, we'll keep refining these. But in the end, we're looking at a project um, with all the proposed improvements um, and some contingency and professional services and things like that of about 2.7, almost $2.8 million. 
I will tell you too, this presentation will be on the city's website. So if anybody's trying to feverishly write down numbers, it'll be posted on the city's website. So how does it get paid for? Funding and cost distribution. Uh, basically, we've got the city contributing to the project with utility funds and some food and beverage tax proceeds. Uh, the county will be using some state aid funds and, and possibly some of their sales tax. Uh, we did get that grant that I mentioned from the DNR uh, to the tune of 150,000. And then the balance would be special assessments to the adjacent properties. So the county's participation is pretty straightforward. They'll pay 100% of costs related to the street reconstruction and the storm sewer. The remaining costs are basically the city and or assessable, meaning the city will pick up all of some of them, some of them will be split. Uh, we do that in accordance with the city's assessment policy. So this is something that's applied uniformly across all projects that we do that are like this, so you're not treated necessarily any different what that says is sewer and water is assessed at 75% of a standard cost. So a standard water main is an eight inch main. And if you heard me before, we're gonna put a 12 inch main in. So what that means is we're only gonna assess on the basis of this eight inch main. Anything over that, the city pays through the utility funding. Um, a standard sewer is an eight inch main. That's what we'll be putting in. Um, Again, the city assumes that remaining 25% oversizing, looping, and non-accessible areas, and that would like, for example, include the western side of the road for the water main. There's no developable property over there, so they're effectively picking up half of that water main cost right out of the gate, and then taking 25% of the remaining. Service laterals are 100% assessed. Lift station is 100% assessed to the ultimate service area. And then the city pays 100% of the cost related to the trail with the grant and the food beverage tax. So that's a long way of saying what's shown on the screen here. Uh, when you break this all down, the county would be uh, looking at about $1.3 million or 48% of the project cost. The city would be looking at about $700,000 or $715,000 at about 26%. And then the balance going to property owners at uh, $731,000, which again is about 26%. That gets us to the $2.8 million price tag. So now we talk about how we allocate that assessable amount that was in that previous table. How does that get spread out amongst the adjacent properties? Uh, again, we go back to the assessment policy that tells us uh, the practices for that. Uh, basically, we look at how much assessable footage is out there divide that accessible cost by the footage or the number of the cost of the service laterals divided by the number of service laterals to come up with a rate. Um, sewer and water are assessed on a front footage basis. So footage is typically the width of your lot, provided that that lot, lot isn't wildly irregular in shape. Uh, if it is, we'll look at an average sort of dimension, uh, but all of these are fairly regular. Um, and then that determines the cost per foot. Service laterals are done on each basis. Lift station is done on an area basis. So we look at the ultimate service area of this lift station. What can it service? How many acres? And come up with a cost per acre and come up with a rate that'll be so many dollars per acre based on the size of your parcel. So this is where it all lands. Special, uh, the estimated special assessments for sanitary sewer would be looking at about $46 foot. Sanitary sewer services are about $2,300 each. Water main is about $44 a foot. Water service at about $3,500 each. And then the lift station is about $26,000 an acre. So obviously I can't run on the screen each and everybody's individual situation. There's some typicals up here. If you had a 40 foot lot, which there are a number of 40 foot lots in there, about a uh, uh, tenth of an acre. Uh, you'd be looking at an assessment of about $12,000. 50 foot lot at 0.15 acres, a little bit more at 14,200. And there are some 100 foot lots at about a quarter of an acre. Uh, you're just, just a little bit below $23,000. So that's kind of how it shakes out. Obviously there's exceptions. I'm just trying to paint the picture of, of most out there. If you have a question specifically on your parcel, you can contact me. I do have them estimated out for every parcel. Um, just give me a call and I can share that number with you. 
Terms and conditions, again, that hearing would be next spring, uh, spring of 22, probably around the April timeframe. Um, assessments would be levied against uh, the benefiting properties starting in 23. So it would go on your taxes starting in 23. Um, typically, these types of projects, they're applied to property taxes for a 20 year term. The interest rate, we won't know until we get there, but it's kind of ranged between four and 5% generally, um, as of lately. You have the option to pay all or a portion of that special assessment in advance, just like a loan, and ultimately reduce your, your interest charges. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to the vice mayor and what, we'll, what we typically like to do is separate these two questions and comments. So if you have questions, uh, you can come up to the podium and state your name and address for the record. And once we get through all the questions, then we'll take comments that can be directed and write, write to the city council. Okay, Vice thanks Mayor. John for that uh, update and report for that. But like John said, at this time, uh, now's the time for you to have questions and comments. And we'll start out with questions. And if you can, please come to the podium. Uh, give us your name and your address. Uh, try not to repeat other people that get up and keep hearing the same thing over and over again. But if you have uh, good questions and new questions, please uh, bring those up for us. So we'll start with questions. This time if you have questions, uh, please come to the podium. Give us your name and address. Grab one quick, uh, uh, easy one for you, John. Brad Wimmer, uh, 1225 Westlake Drive, and then a couple of four rentals in the area. Uh, speed limit. I think yes. that's one of the big, big concerns for uh, neighbors is hopefully the narrowing of the road would lower the speed limit maybe to 15 miles an hour. No, I don't know. Uh, but I think that's a big hope. So address speed limit. I'm sorry. Thank you for bringing that up, Brad. I did forget to incorporate that. We have talked. I mean, ultimately, I, I need to to clarify this, that it's the county's decision being the county road, but the discussion with the county at this point has been to look at reducing the speed limit through there. Right now it's, it's basically 40 through that area. Um, at least maybe knocking that down to 35, whether we go all the way to 30, I, I think there's some, some uncertainty. So think 30 to 35 right now has been the discussion. Um, but to your point, um, the reality of it is we can sign it whatever we want and that typically has very minimal impact. What will have the impact is actually narrowing the road, putting the curb and gutter in. Uh, study after study has demonstrated that that's far more effective than signing. So I do think you're gonna see a pretty dramatic reduction in speed through there because right now, no curb and gutter, very wide road. That's human nature, just go, go fast. And narrowing that up, maybe tightening up the lanes a little bit, um, I think that'll bring people down. Okay, are there any other questions uh, from the group from that area that have a question? Please come forward at this time. Any other questions? Uh, Jeff Phillip, 1158 Westlake Drive would be the west side from County Road 6, south about 190 feet. So, with your calculations there, if I wanted to enter the city and use, have the privilege of using water and sewer, for my property, it'd probably be $50,000. I can tell you that in just a brief second, Jeff. Yeah, for your property that's across the street, which I need to address, I forgot, because you're not in the city limits, Correct. that that portion anyway. Yeah, the estimated would be about $48,000. Okay. But yet you might want to purchase some of my property for the privileges of running a bike path or... Potentially, yep. Under the scenario that's being recommended with keeping the trail on the east side, we would not need to purchase anything. Okay under that scenario. Under the other scenario, yeah, we would need a sliver uh, permanent easement. What's a sliver in Lakes area? Uh, probably five, five feet. <laughs> by? I uh, couldn't tell you. Five by probably 100. That's a pretty big sliver. It's bigger than my lot on the east side. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Just wanted to bring that up. I, if I can, Vice Mayor, I want to follow up. <laughs> I, I did some updates and I forgot to send them to Kerry. Um, there are a couple properties on the west side of the road 
um, in this section, just south of County Road 6. They're not in the city limits. Um, so those properties would not receive an, a, a special assessment right now. It would be a postponed special assessment. If they were ever to come into the city, then we would levy those special assessments at that time. Thank you, John. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? If not, then we'll go to comments. If you have a comment on this project, would you please come forward and give us your name and address? Any comment on this uh, project? Good evening, Vice Mayor and the City Council members. Um, my name is Julie Moore. My husband and I own the property on 118 Line, Westlake Drive. Um, I just want to state from the beginning, we have supported this project from day one. Um, we were actually one of the first ones, I believe, that brought it to the attention of the city back in 2017 at the very first Westlake Drive meeting, which didn't even involve our section. <laughs> right. Um, we, we desperately need the sewer improvements, the water improvements, and we really support the multi-use path. However, where our breakdown happens is uh, which side of the road to place it on. Um, creating the multi-use path sends a clear message to the public. This is the designated path for walking, jogging, rollerblading, etc., bicycling, which implies it's safer than the other options. How could a path on the east side possibly be safer when it will still cross the same 24 driveways, two, are which, uh, two of which are business use, and four are used by the large condo timeshare property, Breezy Shores. Um, there's not a lot of traffic on our shoulder today because of this. In answer to this question, the recommendation from the city is barrier style curbing with a three to five foot median, effectively blocking property owners from accessing their own property with limited access for one vehicle on most properties. Currently today, most, most of us can get three or four vehicles parked on our property. Reducing the homeowner's access to the property does nothing to address the two business use driveways nor the four condo timeshare driveways at Breezy Shores that will still continue to cross the multi-use path, which have considerably more traffic at all hours than our individual homes. The concession to blocking the access to our property offered to homeowners is limited parking on the west side of the road of Westlake Drive, which currently has one and another to a shed driveway, and the rest is empty space along the railroad tracks. A point made many times at the August 24th meeting is the road in question. Westlake Drive is too dangerous, we were told, and busy for a multi-use path to cross. Even when property owners brought up suggestions regarding possible crosswalk markings on the street, signage, and the use of lights. We were told these efforts would not prevent the possibility of just one careless, reckless individual disobeying the law and causing an accident. This is true. In the state of Minnesota, most drivers know, as of September 1st, 2020, failure to obey a crosswalk with or without lights, even if the crosswalk is not marked on the street and is simply a sidewalk to sidewalk connecting a visual line, Failure to honor a pedestrian, bicycle, <coughs> rollerblader crossing the road there uh, is a misdemeanor, punishable by up to 90 days in jail, $700 fine, or both. Also worth noting, heavily used areas in Minnesota that are used, uh, can use a longer than standard illumination of walk or don't walk lights displayed, and the source of this information is the Office of Revisor of Statutes, the Minnesota Safety Council. We were told that even with all these items in place, it is still too dangerous to even consider putting the path uh, on the east side of the road. However, the city is recommending that we, our loved ones, our friends, our children of all ages, my twin 18-month-old grandsons, will be carried across the road with luggage, baggage, at all times of the day, and it's still uh, no lights, no signage to stop traffic when we park by the shoulder. We'll be randomly crossing this same dangerous road um, every time we go to use our property. Property owners, their loved ones and friends will cross this road in the winter. 
We have a lot, we're primarily year-round usage right now. There's a couple cabins that are seasonal. Um, the rentals are year-round. There's traffic at our homes, cars at our homes year-round. We'll be walking across this road on 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve. We celebrate Christmas with our grandchildren and children and parents. We'll be carrying groceries, luggage, toddlers in the summer, coolers and gear with zero lights, zero signage, and zero marked crosswalk across, across the same road that we were told is too dangerous for all of these um, signs, lights, and crosswalk markings to even help. In closing, our greatest concern is not selfish. It is not that we do not want the path near our property. We want it to be safe for every single person that uses it, including us and our grandchildren and our parents. The east side concerns, in summary, um, safety for those using the multi-use path. Number one, the east side, it still crosses the same 24 residential business and condo driveways that it crosses today. It is still in proximity behind our vehicles, only now endorsing it as the official multi-use trail will assuredly increase the usage. Additional concern for ourselves and loved ones crossing the road year round without the benefit of any safety measure to stop traffic. The liability of the designated path crossing near our vehicles if someone were to heaven forbid get hurt. The liability is transferred completely to the homeowners. The lack of access to the property for home repair. We haven't even talked about this. Tree trimming, removal, and shore maintenance. We are required to maintain our properties. Contractors will find it very difficult to help us maintain our properties without being able to bring a trailer with materials or supplies, replacing shingles. We'll have a very difficult time, we already do, finding contractors that are willing to work with us and it is always at a premium and this will only make that worse. The west side benefits. The multi-use path crosses two driveways and can be connected to the current Dutton Locks Trail. Signage, lights, marked crosswalk can be added for safety and laws will apply to those who do not obey. The west side concerns, someone may disobey the traffic laws, the signage, the lights, the crosswalk markings. This is a risk at every single crosswalk and intersection in the country. And a lot of those intersections have a lot more traffic than Westlake Drive. We ask that you please consider these issues that we bring to your attention as you make your decision. Thank you for your time and consideration. And I have a copy of this for you that has signatures of homeowners that support this statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to come forward and make comments for this project? <coughs> Is there anyone else now this time to come forward? Brad Wimmer again, and again, we, uh, we're at 1225, we've got, uh, with rentals, we've got 300 and roughly 335 feet on the uh, property. And, you know, I, I'm in agreement with John and the city, and I think uh, our renters are and, and our homeowners are, uh, I think you, you've, you've addressed, this, addressed the safety issues. Many of the concerns that were brought up, we're facing those today. I mean, uh, I, again, I don't want to go over every point, but uh, service people use our driveways. Uh, they use our, our parking. The, the parking across the street would be a bonus to what we're getting today. You know, we don't have that now. Um, so, so I think some of those things, I, I appreciate how the city has gone methodically <coughs> through this. Uh, I'm concerned, again, for the bikers, the walkers, of which we do all of the above, uh, crossing the intersections. And, and I think the idea that we're going to have more traffic with biking, with all of the above, is a boon to the city. I mean, I, I just smile when Dave gave his report tonight. Uh, you know, I was ecstatic. And, and I think that's what Detroit Lakes wants to bring to the community. I mean, I think, the, and I think the more of that we have, the lower the traffic speed is going to be. And I think the more concerned we are. You know, I, I have to look out my driveway five, six times a day when I leave my driveway. I have to back out with caution. 
and I will have to back out with caution when this uh, new road system goes in. So regardless of which side it's on, I'm going to have to back out with caution, as we do today. So, you know, I think you, you put a lot of thought into it. Uh, we're just extremely anxious, and I think uh, most everybody agrees we need to do something, so we're ecstatic about getting these improvements in. Uh, the bike trail, I think, will do a lot of good things. I think the curb and gutter will bring a lot of good things. I think it will slow down traffic. Uh, I, I think it will bring us more into a neighborhood like South Shore, like many of the other areas of the lake. I think we've been missing that. And I think if we can keep a consistent uh, traffic, and, and, I, and I agree with John, I think this skinning up of the road will be a vast improvement for us. So I think people will not zip around the corners and come across the lake uh, like they do in many areas. And I don't know how else you do it. Uh, like I say, you could put a 15 mile an hour speed limit and they're still going to go 40, 45 if we're as wide as we are. But I think bringing the activity in is going to be a boon. I don't, I don't think it'll double. I think it'll add. Uh, we're excited about having a bike trail, a walking trail around the lake. I mean, I, this is an amenity that most lakes do not have. Uh, you go around any of the lakes, the neighboring, whether it's Sally, Melissa, Pelican, don't have this uh, jewel that Detroit Lakes has the opportunity to have. So again, uh, our properties and, and the uh, uh, lake shore that we have, we're excited for the project coming up. So we appreciate what you've done. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? I saw another man back there stand up. Okay, please come forward. Hey, Chase at 1177 Westlake Drive, and uh, about parking across the street, I have a driveway directly across the street from me, and then there is also a driveway, Jeff's driveway, where that's going to not give us a parking spot if we have the one spot across the street. And uh, another thing with like pets, I have a couple dogs, a lot of other people have dogs, loading dogs and stuff across the street, that's not going to be okay. Um, something's going to happen. Someone's going to lose one. Uh, but a lot of stuff, I agree, but I'm for the walking path on the west side. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Can I ask a question? Please come forward. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to you. Uh, do some comments right now. Well, the comment I have is that, you know, when we have uh, eight, eight grandchildren. <laughs> And we have two families. So you're forcing them to be on the other side of the road. Now, if, if I understand it right, we will have one for own car on the east side, right? Or not? You know, Can you say car. that again, Russ? <laughs> well, in front of our house, if we want to be on the east side, we've been parking all this time. We have mm -hmm. never parked on the other side because, the, well, some of the cars are going 60 miles an hour through there. And uh, they're, they're not paying attention to the and it's not being regulated whatsoever. So, and now I'm going to take my two families that have those kids, and they're going to be carrying their luggage across the across the road with that road. We all know what it's like. It's horrible. So the question is, is that are you going to take care of it and slow it down to at least 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour? You're going to have kids running back and forth. It's so not only getting there, but now they got to get something out of the car. Back and forth, back and forth, and we know what it's all about. So take a, take a picture of your own house and say every time you had to get something, you had to go across the road, and it's going to go, and they're going 60 or 30, 60, whatever they want to out there. It's not even being regulated. So that's a big risk to us, and we've been there since early 80s. We've been on that place. So it's not like we haven't been there before. And I, I just don't understand why you want to do it on one side. But when we're going to back out, even the one stall you have, we might be running over somebody. Someone will have to be out there making sure that there aren't any bikes coming across. So we go across it, and then that's another thing. So both sides, we have both risks. So it doesn't seem like that's quite fair. And that's all I have to say. About What's your that. address, please? Uh, 1185 and, and 1169. We have two of them. And we've had them since the early 80s. Thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> Just remember, I have those seven kids. <laughs> <laughs> we have two. <laughs> yes, almost three. Hi, my name is Brianna Wolf. I'm Chase Roquette's girlfriend. We are at 1177 no, Westlake Drive. Um, Russ and Nancy are on one side. 
end on the other, we're in the middle, and then Troy and them are on the other side. So as Chase had mentioned, there's a driveway straight behind, and then Jeff's other property is to the north and on the west side. So if there's a property that we get, or not a property, but a parking spot that's given on the other side, is it designated or it's just a free-for-all? It's, it's public parking, just like on any other okay. roadway. So we have 33 feet of property. His truck's about 30, 30 feet long. It's a Ford, it's a Ford King Ranch, it's big. He has trailers all the time. So where do I, as a property owner with him, park? Sure, let me, since we're in the question or the comment period, I, I, I'm, I was gonna say, it's I'm gonna direct, my, question, direct it to the council here, but I, I wanna clear the air because I think there seems to be some misconception. The, the proposed alignment on the, on the east side of the roadway council is pulling that roadway west in a fashion that even with the trail on the west or on the east side of the road, the back edge of that trail is still further west than the edge of the existing street pavement. So what that means, another way to say it, everybody's driveway, at least in that northern half, up to about uh, Brad, Brad Wimmer's house, about there, it starts to come back. But everybody between there and six, their driveways are getting longer, longer okay. than, than what they are now. And there currently is no parking on the shoulders. It's all posted by the county as no parking. So while well, I understand what they're saying, I, there's not an intention to take away parking. We will try to maintain those driveway spaces within reason, and there actually should be more space than there is right now. So you're saying if somebody comes, John, they would be able to park their car and unload like they're talking about with suitcases and so forth, yep. company and so forth. Yep. Then they can park on the mm -hmm. west side. What, ab what about their truck being yeah. 30 feet long? <laughs> yeah, I'd have to look to be certain, and I can certainly do that. I don't have the information with me, but I could look at your specific property right. to find out, okay, so what's the difference? A comment after that. So if we're looking at, let's say it goes on our side, and we have to use that other side, we have one, two, three, four, five properties, plus there's another, that tall one on the other side of Jeff's that would have to go on that other side to park a second vehicle? No, I mean, here's my, I drive through there to my house every day too, and I, it, there's no parking on the roadway right now. Right, So all in here. Yep. So if you're only letting one car come in. We're not changing that. Nowhere did we say we're only gonna let one car come in. We can have double wide driveways. Okay. Yep. I think so. the question's coming into the map that was used at the previous meeting yep. shows yellow symbols for the size we assume of people's parking areas. Uh, no. So That's, those are driveways, and they're just, at this point... So where will the curve be? Let, let me finish. Let, let me finish, Julie. The driveways, right now we're at like 10,000 feet. We show driveway locations. Are they of the right width? Not necessarily. We've got to go out, we've got to survey, we've got to get all that stuff figured out. My point being, if you currently pull into your property and you could park two cars side by side, for example, we will continue to do that. Now, are we going to allow a free-for-all, meaning 10 cars wide? Most of the properties aren't that wide, but you get my, my gist. If, there's, if you have a double wide, because that's pretty common, or crumb, you go to any subdivision, driveways are about two stalls wide, generally. We wouldn't have any objection to creating double wide. And again, I have to hit this home. The back of the trail will be further west than the edge of the existing pavement. So I really don't think there's this impact to parking uh, that, that's sort of being as assumed. And I mean that genuinely. Double parking behind each other then? Or back of our vehicles even closer to the trail? Property by property, to have to look at that. There are some properties that, yeah, I think you could get two smaller vehicles back to back. My point is, you all park there right now. Right now. Nobody parks on the, on, on the street. It, and we're not changing that. It's actually getting better. We're moving the road away. We're not um, confident when you say a double-wide opening. Currently, we can get four to five vehicles in front of our house. Nobody parks on the other side of the road. It's the width of our house. We have a 40-foot lot. 
And then 40 feet, depending on vehicles. We can get three trucks, we can get two trucks and two small cars. And we still, might be able, we still might be able to do that with a narrower driveway opening, say a double wide driveway opening, where you can go straight ahead or pull around. I mean, there are a lot of, there's a lot of garages in the city. Okay, I'm I, not going to get into I, it. I, I think at this time, I'll, I'm going to, unless there's something uh, new to uh, bring up, because we're hearing a lot of repeats now, I think we'll go ahead and uh, close the public hearing part, and we'll go back to the uh, city council, and I'll call on uh, Madeline Suki for, to, to make the resolution. Um, the uh, Public Works Committee has been over and over and over this, and uh, and we are uh, in favor of um, moving to accept the resolution authorizing the improvements and ordering the preparation of plans and specifications for the street and utility improvements for Westlake Drive. Okay, and there's a motion, so then is there a second? Second. There's a section. Now we'll go into discussion. Is there any discussion on this now amongst the council members? Uh, Vice Mayor, I have, I have questions first for, for John, but then I'd like to also, uh, speak my comments as well. Uh, Mr. Pratt, looking at this, and you said the road width would be going down to 35 feet? 30 to 32 okay. is what we're thinking right and now. That's very similar to what it would be north of Highway 6, then, correct? Correct. So that road width of 30 to 32, how does that compare to McKinley or Roosevelt Avenues? Significantly narrower. So it is narrower than those two roads even? Yep. Generally okay. speaking, McKinley, Roosevelt, those, eh, Roosevelt's a little different, but a, a lot of the roads that you see, two lanes of traffic with parking on both sides, Washington Avenue, for example, mm -hmm. those are 44 foot wide roads. Okay. So this would be even narrower than that. Yes. Okay. Yep. Therefore, what we've seen in your, your experience and what we've seen around town, by taking roads that are, are massively open like Westlake Drive is now and sh kind of bottlenecking that intentionally, I mean, we've seen speeds reduced just because of comfort of driving, correct? Yeah, that's been studied over and over and over in, in the industry as far as the most effective way to control speed is actually giving roads a, a diet. Okay. Um, I, I should clarify, 30 to 32 feet where we don't have on-street parking, mm -hmm. where we're trying to have some on-street parking on that west side, on the north end, obviously the streets uh, gonna be closer to 40, 40, 40 ish in that area. All right, thank you. Um, next question uh, for police chief is, can you think of an instance where obviously we want pedestrian safety to be at the utmost and foremost. Can you think of an instance where these people are talking about bringing coolers, grandkids, presents, Easter bunny cakes, everything else across the road, would these people be allowed in a considerable amount of time to put their hazards on and park and unload and then enter their vehicle again and park on the other side of the road? Can you ever think of an instance where we would issue citations for that? No. Okay. And I'm assuming that would be related to your officers to please respect the loading and unloading zone in an appropriate amount of time. Okay. Head nod, yes, correct? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, that's all I have for questions. Can I go into comments? Go ahead with a comment. Okay. I, do, I work at Lake Shirts. I do t-shirt math, so my math is not great. But I look at this and go, even if there's 24 driveways and people are going on average five times in and out a day, you add in four driveways for the commercial being the bowling alley and the Breezy Shores, that gets me up to 320 potential crossings. Where now I'm, I'm struggling, if we put this on the west side of the road, we're asking people to cross traffic twice on a 5,000 traffic road. So we're asking them to cross 10,000 times compared to 320. I, I struggle with that. I, I've, I realize change is tough, change is difficult, but change isn't always bad. And, and the reason I say this, I drive this every day myself. I live within a mile of that, this area. Um, I, I see this as, as being a lot of benefits to this area of town. The, not only the trail, uh, and, but also the, the slower speeds and narrowing it down. Um, the road, to, to Mr. Pratt's point, is moving to the west. That's a benefit right there. Whether the driveways are going to be too wide, three deep, whatever, that's yet to be figured out. Um, you know, curb and gutter to help the lake and the environment and keep some of that 
stormwater collection that we currently don't have. Um, I, I feel that this is, the east side is the right place to go. I really do. Um, that's, that's my two cents. I've, so that's where I stand. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions from council members? I guess my one question slash comment. Um, those of you that are talking about like when your family comes, the people that have come up and talked about it, when they come and they park so they can just go right into your house, are they parked on your driveway or are they parked on the lawn? That's the kind of the point. We do not have driveways. We have, per the Pelican River Watershed District and City, when we rebuilt our house in 2016, crush rock, a specific kind of rock, our bordering our entire property line, continues into the neighbor's property line, and so on. Okay. Um, there is no curb. Okay. Uh, we were hoping for a drive over curb for that space so that we do not have to. Um, park across the road and, and I think that's part of the problem is that that you all are used to being able to park on your lawns and it's not a lawn or this you know lawn. but when you have the, it's when you have people come it's they can lawn. drive they can drive on to that but with putting in regular curb and gutter is that even going to be possible yeah I, you know vice mayor and council I I think to the point of this concern, I guess what I want to try to convey is I will make an, a valiant attempt to go and look and talk with Julie and some of the neighbors and what can we do, okay? Maybe we have to, yeah, I'd, generally as a rule of thumb, we don't want to promote really, really, really wide driveways, right? I mean, we don't. We have ordinances that specify certain widths. Is there an extenuating circumstance where we try to meet in the middle a little bit? Again, it, let's say the driveway driveway, lawn, whatever it is. I mean, they could park all the way across the property. It's 50 feet wide right now. And maybe we can get that down to some something where you can still come in and go like this and this and this and like that and reach some sort of consensus where it makes some sense. So I'm not lost on hope that we'll find something that's, that's going to work. We're just, I, I don't want to sound like I'm dismissing your comments, Julie. We just got to get there. And we just have very they are. Yeah. And, and agreed. Agreed. And so I think, while I won't guarantee that nothing's going to change, um, I think there's things we can do to probably, I think there's this picture of, I'm going to get one driveway opening for one car, and that's it. And that's, that's not what we're going to do. And if we need to do something more than that, we, I think we can work through that. So that's sort of my comment back to the council, I guess. Well, and that's kind of what I wanted you to point out, that there is a way to work around mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. because, I mean, I drive by there too in the summertime and I see cars and how you're, how you're trying to park closer and that kind of thing. And we don't want to eliminate that or make that dangerous for you either. But um, we're looking at the overall picture as well. So. Uh, I, I wanted to say too that this council and many council before us over the years have tried to help your area because of those small lots. And uh, in most parts of town, what we've done there would never be allowed. And we've done what we could so you could have your lake homes there because they are small. But at the same time, in a situation like this, now it kind of comes back and bites us because we helped to give you what you wanted. Because on some of those where you're right up on the road, you know, we tried our best to help you all along on this. But uh, it's, it's just how that property that you have down there, some of you have smaller property than others, so it, it does make it very difficult. Uh, is there any other questions or comments uh, from council people? Uh, two more that I forgot, I'm sorry. Okay. One, and I think it's probably the council wishes to, to maximize parking on the west side if we can. You know, I know you're very cognizant of that. I think adding parking there would be in everybody's best interest. So please take that into consideration. Uh, two, uh, people's concerns about backing out. I, I completely understand that, and we got a ton of sidewalks, miles of it in town, that people do this every day. So I don't think it's anything different than on Summit Avenue, than on Roosevelt, anywhere else that there's high traffic areas. I think about where Vice Mayor Zeman lives out on north of 34 on uh, Roosevelt there. You know, you got people backing out in high traffic areas that are speeding that still have to be cautious. So I think that is, is we're not trying to pass the buck and push that on anybody, but I think that's, we ask other people in DL to do that as well. 
Okay. Okay, Dan. Well, kind of a question, comment, maybe more for maybe the city engineer and or the council here. I know that there's the the speed issue came up all all the time, and you know, trying to calm that down. Is there other ways that we could do maybe flashing lights to say, you know, draw people's attention just to to the the you know more caution and whether you know, we like flashing lights at uh, roundabouts, but can we put some flashing lights to slow people down at, uh, at this section just to say, hey, caution, pedestrians no. crossing, um, just to further. Radar signs have been studied and kind of shown to have some pretty good effect at getting people's attention as you're, you know, if you're cruising in from out in the rural area, it can be a good reminder when that blinks at you and you're 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. So, I mean, there's things like that that we could consider to, to help mitigate that and get people to slow down in addition to just the road diet. Yeah, so just if we can consider some of those things that as we, if, if the county or, or whoever does the speed study doesn't get on board with reducing the, the speeds enough and we need to do a few more calming techniques, uh, I think we should look at the, the calming techniques to get that, uh, to get into people's heads that it's, it, it is, should be slow and we should be paying attention to any crossings sure. going on. Any other comments or questions from council members? I'm going to ask one. Would we be better off eliminating the across the street parking and just moving the whole road that, that much farther over? The, the challenge is we, we can't move the road that far over because I still have to get back on alignment across County Road 6. So I can't move the road on the north side of County Road 6 any further. We have a hard driveway there with a steep bank. Yep. So I can't move that any further. So meaning I can't get over on the other side any further. Thank you. Okay, any other comments or questions? If not, I think we'll go ahead and uh, call the question, the consideration resolution authorizing the improvements and ordering the preparation of plans and specifications for the street and utility improvements for Westlake Drive uh, uh, um, Highway or County Road 6, State Aid Road uh, to uh, Pelican River. This time we'll take the motion. Uh, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Thanks to all of you for coming tonight, too. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, adjourn our regular meeting for another public hearing. Uh, at the, we'll let the group get out here. <laughs> Pardon me? What if I have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> hey, my presentation was shorter than the cut question comment period. Okay. Uh, next item is uh, for public hearing to receive public comments on the proposed assessments for streets, stormwater, sanitary sewer, and water improvements for the Lake Forest 8th edition and 270th Avenue. And John, I'll call on you again for comments on that. Vice Mayor and Council, buckle up. This is going to be light speed compared to the last one. Um, <laughs> there's nobody here for this, but we still need to go through the motions. Assessment hearing for Lake Forest 8th edition and portion of 270th Avenue. Uh, we're required to do this under state statute. Uh, we'll go through the improvements, costs, financing, and questions and comments if you have any. A uh, little bit of background on it. This, uh, the developer, Marty Sullman, petitioned the city for the street utility improvements. This represents the final portion of the Lake Forest subdivision. It's about 14 acres of property, 22 lots, single family and twin homes. Uh, basically, we put in water main on 270th and within the subdivision the same with uh, sanitary sewer we had to extend that from south shore drive we we're out of grade in the development so we had to run a new main in there uh, there's a pretty picture of it uh, storm water uh, we had to install storm water on all the new streets we had to do treatment and rate control uh, that was generally provided by an existing regional basin uh, within the subdivision but we also had to install a new infiltration area on the south end of south shore park to deal with the runoff from 270th <coughs> Avenue. Uh, new streets were typical, 36 foot wide urban section within the subdivision. Uh, the north end of 270th, we reconstructed as an urban section, 40, 41 feet wide. Um, and then there's also a new connection into the subdivision <coughs> from 270th Avenue uh, in the southwest corner there. Estimated costs, uh, the final project costs, uh, I should qualify this, we're, we're substantially complete on the project, so I'm projecting these final costs. 
uh, about $1,274,000 all in. Uh, financing funded by city and special assessments in accordance with our policy. Uh, sanitary sewer and water main, 100% of the costs are assessed. City pays for any oversizing or looping. Services, 100% assessed. Stormwater uh, for a new service area like this is split 50-50 with the development and the city. Uh, the street, 100% of the costs. 270th we view it as a reconstruction, so per policy that's a 50-50 split. Um, lighting, 100% city share. Uh, property that is adjacent to 270th Avenue on the west side of 270th Avenue. The east side is the park. That's us. We're going to have to pay for that. The west side is property that's outside of the city limits uh, currently. Uh, so we'll, we'll assume the stuff on the, the east side along the park. The under, on the other side, that'll be a postponed assessment. And those assessments will be levied if and when that property ever comes in. So the way this all shakes out, uh, all said and done, the city's share on this one is significantly higher than a typical subdivision because of our ownership in South Shore Park on 270th. So we have about $300,000 into this. Uh, we've got about $163,000 in postponed assessments that we would hopefully collect at some point in the future. And then assessments to the Lake Forest subdivision of 800,000, bringing us to the 1.2 million. Um, allocation is basically a per lot uh, allocation for the Lake Forest uh, assessments. We have two assessment roles in this case. So Lake Forest is per lot and then a front footage allocation for those properties adjacent to 270th Avenue. So this is what the uh, cake looks like when it's baked um, for Lake Forest. All said and done, um, you're looking at single family lots of about $35,000, twin home lots of 39,000. That does not include $56,000 of de previously deferred special assessments back from the lake project in the mid 90s. That 56,000 is being captured in these assessments. It's just spread as a, a bottom line adder. So we will collect all of that in addition to what is shown there. 270th Avenue, these are postponed. Again, here's the, the rates uh, per foot and per each. Uh, so those lots actually would be coming in at about $27,000, which compared to most of our special assessments, that's pretty rosy. Uh, assessment terms for Lake Forest, which is role A, developer prepaid 25% of that assessable cost that I just went over before we started construction. So he's prepaid that 25%, the remaining balance plus any of those previously deferred costs that I talked about. It's assessed for 15 years following a five-year deferral that'll start in January. Uh, interest rate will be 4%. Roll B, outside, those are postponed. We'll levy them if and when that property is annexed into the city, and then we'll establish the terms at that time. Uh, I want to point out there is one more assessment role that will come onto this project, and that is the overlay further south on 270th that we're doing with uh, the township, if you recall. That ha hasn't been completed. That'll be completed next year, so we'll have to have another assessment hearing specifically for that next year. That's it. Vice Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anybody in the audience who would like to make a comment on this project? Is there anybody in that area that would like to come up and make a comment this time? Here's that there isn't, so I'm going to go ahead and call on you, Madeline, for recommendations here. Yes, Public work, Works moves to uh, approve the adoption of uh, the assessment for street, stormwater, sanitary, sewer, and water main improvement project for Lake Forest 8th edition and 270th Avenue. Second. And there's a second. Is there any questions? <coughs> any comments? <coughs> My name is Gary Costa. I live here in Detroit Lakes on Madison. But I've been looking at your figures and I have a question. The total assessment amount, that's split over how many years? In this case, it's a 15 year term, but that's following a five year deferral. The, 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 the developers have two options. They can either set, take a term of a 20 year term starting now for 20 years, 
or they can take a deferment for five years and then a 15-year term. So the amount is divided by 15 years? Plus interest. Plus interest. Correct. Okay, and that was the same with the first one? Yes. Okay, yeah. that's with the same for all of them, right? Correct. The thing that changes is on reconstruction projects, we always do a 20-year term, and the interest rate is variable. It depends on what the city's able to secure their financing at, plus some for the issuance costs. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? Okay, uh, Madeline? We have a motion. Okay, we have a in a yeah. second then. And any uh, comments here for, as far as from the uh, council at all then on that particular item? So this is a consideration uh, to a resolution approving the adoption assessment role for street, stormwater, sanitary, sewer, and water main improved project for Lakes Forest 8th edition and Toyota 7th Avenue. All in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. Before I go any further on public hearings, I see that we've got a couple gentlemen that I have I forgot to call on. And so I'm going to take these and we'll get back to our public hearings. But the first one is going to be item 5C. We've got Dave, David Noner. Uh, this is consideration for the first reading of ordinance number 482 rezoning property at 600 Homestead Street from an R1 single family to R2 one and two family district. Uh, and he's representing his dad, Don Noner. And Larry, do you want to comment on this? Well, essentially, the request is to change the zoning of this lot from R1 to R2. The R1 zoning requires a 50-foot rear yard setback, and this lot is only 105 feet deep. Whereas in the R2 district, you can have a 30-foot rear yard setback, which makes this property more usable and more buildable. The uh, Planning Commission unanimously recommends approval. Okay, you recommend approval on that. Okay, um, Dan, would you like to... Make a recommendation up with, with the motion there? Yeah, the CBC looked at this uh, last night uh, um, as of the consideration to first. Nope, sorry. Consideration to the resolution. Nope, that's yeah. not it. Where am I? I <laughs> see. Oh, it is, I was on the right place. <laughs> I've just been taking up so much time with Mr. Pratt, so it's kind of zoned out here. So um, item C, yes, is uh, consideration of the first reading ordinance 482 rezoning property at 600 Homestead Street from R1 single family to R2. Uh, one and two family district, uh, Dave Noner. Um, CDC recommends approval and I so move. Second. Okay, is the motion a second? Is there any comments? If not, all in favor of the motion going from R1 to R2, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. Thanks, David, for coming. Get your dad for me. Let's go on to uh, item uh, five. Dave will call for Dave Pratt. Dave, sorry to make you, uh, are you are you going to stay with yours here? Are, are you are you going to? I've got you coming up here now on 5D here now. Also, we, we did the gentleman. We did. We, just did, we, did, that we did. We did for different Dave. Dave. Different Dave. 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 Different one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, but I wanted you to wait so you could see your son at work. Thanks, Ron. Yes. <laughs> Another day. <laughs> okay, but uh, we'll. Uh, What's you don't, you don't want to say we got go ahead we've got your item coming up. We're going to taking yours right now. We're taking yours right now. Oh. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> item five D is uh, consideration to resolution approving the preliminary plat of Sherwood Oaks at seven thirty five Sherwood Drive. Uh, uh, Dan, you want to take this then? Yeah. So the item D is consideration to resolution approving the preliminary preliminary plat of Sherwood Oaks at seven thirty five Sherwood Drive. Um, Planning Commission uh, reviewed this. Uh, it recommends approving the plat with the six conditions. Um, a few of the items that we're really uh, uh, stressing here is uh, stormwater and uh, water not leaving the site um, as much as possible and, and paying park dedication fees. And if you want me to read all six of the conditions, I can, but they're in the packet. We have in the packet. All right. Um, now I got to get back to the. So I did read that. Uh, CDC uh, reviewed this last night. Recommends approval, and I so move. Second. Sec Is there's a second then? Any, any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed. That motion carries. And let's do E also for Dave Pratt while he's here. He is consideration of a first reading of ordinance 483 rezoning property 735 Shorewood Drive from RA. Agricultural residential to R2, one and two family residential. Um, 
Again, Planning Commission reviewed this. CDC reviewed this. Uh, recommends approval, and I so move. Second. There's a motion in the second. Is there any discussion on this? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. Thanks, Dave, for coming tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back uh, to our public hearings. Uh, once again, I'm going to adjourn our regular meeting for a public hearing. This one is for item C. Um, public hearing to receive public comments on a proposed assessments for streets, stormwater, sanitary, sewer, and water main improvement projects for Ridgeview first edition. John. Thank you, Vice Mayor and Council. We'll try to go through this one even quicker because it's pretty similar to the Lake Forest one. This is the assessment hearing for the Ridgeview first edition project that's currently underway. Again, required to do this by state statute 429. We'll go through the improvements, the cost financing, and then have some questions and comment period. A uh, little bit of background, the developer, John Burquist, petitioned the city for these street utility improvements. The first phase of what could be a 94 acre subdivision, uh, the preliminary or the plat actually contains about 74 lots for the whole thing. The first, first phase of the project uh, is 12, limited to 12 lots. Existing infrastructure was installed on Long Lake Road back in 2006 and can provide service to most of the western area of the development. Uh, essentially, we're putting in uh, pretty standard sewer, water, streets, etc. The only exception in this case is we're running an oversized water main through this area uh, with the idea that that main could be a transmission main to areas in Munson Lake and south of County Road 6 uh, someday should the city ever grow in that direction. Um, that's about the only exception there. Um, Stormwater, we put in a collection system. We also started uh, a regional treatment basin that'll service a good portion of the ultimate subdivision. So rather than ponds in each one of these phases, we've, we've built out uh, a larger system that could accommodate some of the future stuff. Uh, the, the result of that is us, the, between the city and the developer, carrying some additional costs up front right now um, for that. Uh, street, standard 36 foot wide urban section. Uh, estimated costs, um, looking at a total project cost of about $640,000. That does not include 61800 and some change for previously deferred assessments from the 2006 Long Lake Annexation Project. Uh, projects funded by city and special assessments, accords with our policy. Uh, same dance here, sewer and water main, 100% of the cost. City pays for the oversizing and looping, so we do have some oversizing costs with that water main. Service laterals are 100% assessed. Stormwater split 50-50 between uh, the subdivision and the city. And street, 100% of the costs are assessed. This is how it shakes out. Uh, city share, in this case, was about $111,000. <coughs> Again, it's those 50% for the current phase one stormwater, future stormwater, and then we have some of that seven, about $18,000 in water main oversizing. And the balance of uh, 528,000 is being assessed. Uh, assessments are distributed to the adjacent properties within the subdivision uh, on a per lot allocation in this case. This is what it looks like in this particular case. Uh, you're looking at total uh, estimated per lot of $40,000. Again, um, that does not include the 61000 previously deferred. Um, and the way we did that is we spread that across 12 of the lots within the subdivision. Then there's also another lot that's within the plat but not being improved. That got hit with about a $20,000 uh, special assessment, and that's how we allocated that. Um, and then we also have the st future stormwater costs. Those are deferred assessments uh, to future portions of the subdivision. Again, the developer paid prepaid 25% of the assessable cost prior to starting the construction project. Um, the remaining balance plus the deferred assessments are going for a 15-year term following a five-year deferral starting this, this the end of this year, 4% interest rate. Vice Mayor. Okay. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Okay, uh, Dan, do you want to take this one in? No. Or, oh, excuse me, Amanda. <laughs> Again, Public Works uh, moves to approve the adoption of the assessment role for street stormwater, sanitary sewer and water main improvement projects for Ridgeview first edition. Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. 
Well, we're going to adjourn our meeting again for another public hearing. Uh, item D, public hearing to consider proposed assessments for unpaid streetlight fees, water, sewer, and stormwater charges. And I'll call on Heidi. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Zeman. Um, this evening, you have an, in your packet, and I have an updated listing of folks who um, have some delinquent water, sewer, stormwater, and streetlight utility bills. Um, annually, we notify these property owners or customers that they have um, bills that have not been paid, give them an opportunity to pay those bills, and then if they are not paid, they are assessed to property taxes for the, uh, the following year. Um, this year, it is... These are being assessed over one year at 5% interest. Um, it's just a way for the city to recoup some of those fees that were not paid. Um, I guess I would stand for any questions. Any questions for Heidi? If not, uh, Natalie, do you want to take care of this? Sure, the finance we can. Is. Excuse me, um, okay. we should open the public oh, hearing. excuse me. Uh, is there comment. anybody here? I didn't see anybody. If there's anybody here that would like to come here for that portion. Um, seeing none, uh, we'll uh, close the public hearing and go to back to the council. So, finance reviewed this amount in the amount of four thousand one hundred and forty-three dollars and eighty-nine cents, and we move to approve the consideration to a resolution adopting the assessment roll for unpaid streetlights, water, sewer, and storm water charges. Is a motion? Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Oppose that motion carries. Uh, we'll adjourn our regular meeting for a public hearing for item uh, E, public hearing to consider proposal assessment for unpaid fire protection charges. And once again, I'll call on Heidi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zeman. Uh, this evening we have two, um, two folks who have not paid on um, fire protection bills that were sent out. Again, this is an annual assessment that we, that we do do if, if these bills remain unpaid. Um, they'll go on the properties at uh, for one year at 5% interest and I would stand for any questions um, after hey, Is there anybody here in the public like to speak to this? It doesn't look like this so we'll close the public hearing and we'll go to uh, uh, Natalie once again. So finance also reviewed this one in the amount of $4,771.49 and moves to approve the consideration to a resolution adopting the assessment role for unpaid fire protection charges for the year 2020-2021. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. And uh, it looks like we've taken care of all those then, huh? And so then with that, we're going to go back to our regular items and we'll go to item uh, 5A, Dan, uh, community development. All right, so item A is consideration to a resolution setting a public hearing for the proposed vacation of utility easements in lots 1, 2, 4, and 5 of Block 2 of Tower Road Industrial Park. This, is, uh, this was reviewed by the CDC last night and uh, recommends approval, and I so move. Motion, is there a second? Second. And there's a second. Is there any discussion about these lots? This is uh, just a public hearing uh, to be set to uh, vacate the um, utility easements up at the public works garage site area for the county and city co-op uh, properties. Okay, so this is a consideration of resolution saying a public hearing for the proposed vacation of the utilities easement of lots 1, 2, 4, and 5 of lots 2 of Tower Road Industrial Park. Hearing no other discussion, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Oppose that motion carries. <coughs> Item B is consideration to a resolution denying the expansion of a non-conforming use in an order to construct a 1,516 square foot addition to a 1,400 square foot storage building at 874 Shorewood Drive. Uh, CDC reviewed this, Planning Commission removed, or reviewed this, uh, recommends uh, Approval of denying this uh, <laughs> to, oh, to deny. Yeah, all, right. Yeah, yeah. all right, recommends denying this uh, expansion, and I so move. Is there a second? There's a second. Any discussion? Um, Larry, you just want to cover what the issue is here. You know, the issue here is that a uh, person has a 1,400 square foot storage building on a vacant lot, and essentially that's not a permitted use. So in order to 
do anything with it, they would need to get a non-conforming use expansion permit. This request would more than double the size of the building. The Planning Commission felt that it was an inappropriate uh, use and they recommended denial. Okay, thank you, Larry. So this motion, a second is to for consideration to a resolution denying the expansion of a non-conforming use in order to construct a 1,516 square foot building to a 1,400 square foot storage building at 874 Short Shortwood Drive uh, by baseline development. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Oppose that motion carries. And it looks like then we go over to uh, the public works and I'll call on Madeline. Okay, um, item A, Dave has already appeared before us. Uh, item B, um, Karen Scoyles and uh, Ms. Oman, who is the Marshmallow Foundation's director, appeared before the Public Works Committee to provide us with an animal control report. I'll make it short and sweet over um, to date uh, this year, they've taken care of 130 little animals that have been turned over to them. So, I mean, it's, there's lots of dogs and kitties and goats and cows and they do all kinds of, they take care of all kinds of things, even reptiles and birds. Item C, consideration to the second reading and adoption of Ordinance 482 amending City Code Section 1. 1001A, this is the city beach relative to parking boats overnight on the beach. Um, Public Words Works had a um, quite a discussion about this, but uh, moves to adopt Ordinance 482 with the uh, parking overnight hours uh, between 2 and 6, right? 5.30, I think. 2 and 6 on the beach. 2 and 5.30. 2 and 5.30. Two and five thirty. Two and five thirty. Oh. So close. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a, a motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. Is there any discussion on this? I'm curious what the penalty would be if you did leave your boat there. Well, first of all, it will be complaint driven. In other words, police won't, aren't going to be patrolling the beach to provide tickets if they are. It's a complaint driven. So. We'll call on Kelsey for what might be the appropriate yep. fine. Vice Mayor and Council, and I'll let Charlie or Chief Todd correct me here, but you know, I, I think uh, the enforcement provision of the ordinance allows it for it to be a, uh, a misdemeanor violation, but it also allows us to do administrative fines. I don't know if we've set an administrative fine, $200, for the beach violation, so... Okay, any other questions on that? So this is consideration. Can I ask another question? Okay, sure, go ahead. So when you define it as a misdemeanor, that's punishable by jail time for leaving your boat on the lake. That's correct. Correct? Correct. Correct. And a two hundred dollar fine if you did. <laughs> we is first of all we'll quit leaving your pontoon on the beach. Uh, I don't have one, but <laughs> <laughs> I know people who do one. Holy smokes, that's pretty steep. Just, I'm sorry, it surprised me that it would be a misdemeanor. I thought it would be a petty misdemeanor fine payable, but that's... We typically will try to enforce the administrative penalties provision, which allows people to avoid prosecution altogether. So it's only the ones who are unwilling to accept their fine. What is the administrative penalty? That's the $200. That's the $200 fine yeah. prior to any criminal charges? Correct. Any other questions? So there's a motion and a second for consideration to a second reading adopting the ordinance number 42 amending the city code section 1001A city beach relative to parking boats overnight in the beach. Okay. All in favor of the motion. Uh, Hi, oh, excuse I'm me. I'm sorry. Um, so is this typical to a parking to a parking situation, Charlie, or, or not? I mean, is, this, is, it, is, it, is it a misdemeanor if I park in the wrong spot in some other area with my vehicle and not? Not we do have some parking penalty. penalties. Um, they're differently amounted. They're not typically two hundred dollars, so this would be more than sure your average parking. It's true, and parking violations are typically not misdemeanors. 
I guess I'm a little taken aback a little bit because I don't think we talked about it being a misdemeanor or that there would be a two hundred dollar fine. Or or maybe uh, that I, I maybe that, that I didn't understand it. That could have been true also. But I yeah, I, I don't recall that. I don't recall that. Those are good questions. I think that part of this. Those are good questions. Frankly, mm -hmm. just remember the the beach ordinance has a lot of other provisions oh, in there. So the everything that's in that beach ordinance is enforceable as a misdemeanor oh, okay. and fee schedule. So, oh. um, I mean, gotcha. we'll be adopting the fee schedule in December. Oh, so okay. um, if you want to change the fine, you could change the fine. Um, that's a council and, discretion. And we did talk to you about that one rental place that uh, comes down and leaves uh, their pontoons on them on a flatbed to rent all the time too that would yeah. include that too yeah. on it. Yeah. We could defer it to discuss it further if you would like. I mean, I, I certainly, is there a problem with deferring it? Let's just say that. Well, well the entire beach ordinance is a misdemeanor. <laughs> yeah, so, so it is. Right. See, You'd have to change all I that. think you have to change the whole beach ordinance, but we could, we could change the font. Yeah, like the parking fine is twenty five dollars, so you can change. Nobody's going to be parking their pontoons on the beach before we address the fines issue. And we could but do. But passing we, this takes it the next step, correct? Well, I mean, the, once this is passed, you don't go back, and then we figure out the fine after. Correct, well, we, because this is a second reading. But the, you know, but we we do have control over the fine, though. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And that's coming, you said November, we'll be looking at that? December, we always December, adopt our fee okay. schedule. So we, we, we this particular that. section of, or this particular change, remember, there was already an existing prohibition with regard to, um, you know, utilization of the beach. And this is all of the various restrictions that we have in utilization of the beach. Again, the city beach, so from Legion to the pavilion. And every one of those restrictions and provisions violation of any one of those things is has been a, a misdemeanor for but it was 20 or 30 years right adoption um, we typically enforce it through, it's not in our through the administrative penalties ordinances where you would set an administrative penalty like kelsey says at the december meeting the reason it's a misdemeanor is is if we don't get cooperation from the uh, offender uh, making it a petty misdemeanor is just another, just another monetary penalty that they didn't pay the first time, so they're not going to pay the second time, and we've got no way to enforce it. So the city attorney's office would much prefer that you leave it as a misdemeanor and deal with. And I, well, you know, I don't care what you set the fine at. Exactly. If you want to make it a five dollar so fine, that's if we whatever. do it this way, we leave it as a misdemeanor. But we can adjust the two hundred dollars in December. The penalty. In December, in December. The penalty. Yep. So I've got a question now. So <laughs> this is all part of the beach area ordinance, and we're so we're fining people. We've got the ability to fine people two hundred dollars an administrative penalty to have a bottle of beer or walk their dog out there, or any of those violations that we set two years ago or a year and a half ago, and then. Who is enforcing the administrative policy? Policy, because I, if you've got a pontoon in there, we can see that a little bit easier. But are we going to have the police department go down there and administer administrative fines versus a misdemeanor for walking their dog on the park or in on the beach? Yes. Well, okay. <laughs> it seems like we're redoing this whole ordinance. Okay. This is just one particular tweak to the to the to the beach ordinance, okay? Um, and you're setting a restriction on parking the, your pontoon there overnight. There are a variety of other restrictions in the beach ordinance. I mean, how many boats you can have at a dock? How many docks you can have? How many? I mean, there's there's a. I don't want to go through the whole term of the ordinance. The way that the administrative penalties works is that yes, the the law enforcement officers can issue the administrative penalty. You guys set whatever the, the fine amount is to be, right? Um, and uh, typically, people will pay their fines, okay? If they don't pay their fines, then the city has the option, not the requirement, but the option 
to then refer it for prosecution to the city prosecutor's office, okay? That doesn't always occur. It only occurs if they don't pay their administrative penalty. Okay? But it is a way of making them pay their administrative penalty. And typically what happens in that situation is that once the, there has been, once it's been turned over to the prosecutor's office and they get the nice letter from the prosecutor, they typically do pay their fine. And then the misdemeanor charge is usually dismissed upon payment of the fine. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's call a motion then. Uh, all in favor of consideration to the second reading and adoption of ordinance number 42, amending the city code section 1001A, City Beach, relative to parking votes overnight. And on the beach, all in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Nay. I don't know the right word. Yep. Okay, we have one, one <laughs> opposed there. Okay. So that, that motion carries. And uh, when we do the fee schedule, think about, yes. you know, when we, we, we yeah. set that amount. <laughs> so, ma'am, let's go on to the next item then. Okay. Uh, item D is consideration to a memo from the Public Works Director approving grinding the brush pile at the compost site. Um, the Public Works Committee reviewed the bids and moved to accept the low bid of 16000 and odd, some odd dollars um, to uh, grind the brush pile at the compost site. And it appears uh, today that the county may be um, sharing that cost. So um, we move to approve that. Second. And this motion is second. And I also, Sean, if you would say any comment on that, but this is part of our budget, correct? It's in our budget. This, I, this 16,000. Uh, on that. But it was it's, not a budgeted item. It was not a budget item. Okay, it was not a budget item. But okay. Uh, anything you want to say else about this? Because uh, we had two bids, and this is by far the lowest bid that we had. Correct. Correct then. Okay. So we've got a motion and a, and a second. All in favor uh, for consideration of the memo for the public director to approve grinding the brush pile at the comp uh, compost site. Uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. And then, John, do you want to give us a city engineering report there, please? Probably the better question is, do you want me to give the city engineer report? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you could just give us a recap of what you've got going on yeah, right now. Yeah, I can, I can, I can do that. Vice Mayor and Council, um, you know, I'm going to kind of glaze over a lot of this, but Westlake Drive, we're going to have a closed session and talk a little bit more about that. We continue to work towards uh, reaching an agreement and uh, moving that project ahead. But again, we'll go into closed session and talk more about that. Um, Westlake Drive, six to the Pelican River. I think we've talked about that enough tonight. Uh, the Burquist or the Ridgeview subdivision, that is underway. Sewer and water are complete. Uh, contractor will be working on storm sewer here yet this week and then moving towards street construction in the, in the coming week or two. Uh, the Bristlin subdivision, there was some movement on that. I did receive a copy of the plans and specs that were prepared by the developer. Those are on my desk for review. Uh, so we're reviewing and commenting and making sure that everything is sort of in order on that. I haven't heard if they intend to try to start anything this fall. I sort of suspect that probably too late to start anything this year, but the project is moving ahead. Uh, Willow Homes for AZ, that's our large reconstruction project. Um, the sewer water street are done between Cheryl and West Avenue. Uh, and right now they've got, got it graded, got some class five down. And last I heard, uh, the concrete contractor will be coming in, barring weather, uh, tomorrow to start curb and gutter. We're still finishing up some underground between West and Rossman and getting the bore underneath the track and some of that. Uh, it's some pretty tedious work. Uh, but on schedule, uh, still looking at probably wrapping up and being paved and substantially complete on that area within, within the month. Uh, Lake Forest 7th edition, again, we talked about that tonight. That is basically wrapped up other than wear course and the overlay on 270th, and that will occur next spring. Highland Drive, um, we've had some discussion uh, both with uh, some city officials and staff and county staff and, and the township supervisor got together and started discussing what that might look like in the way of cost participation, who's going to lead the project, et cetera. Uh, and where that's going is there's going to be a joint meeting between um, this council and the township board at the special meeting next week to hash that out just a bit further. Uh, still looking at trying to get that underway next year. 
and Willow Springs is deferred for a year. Okay, questions? Any other questions for John? Uh, thank you very much. And Madeline, you have also yep. two other items? We have two other items. Uh, one is uh, an application for street closure for the Holy Rosary School Marathon. Um, this, is an, this is an annual event usually that um, takes them around <coughs> town and out and around the lake. Um, Public Works moves to um, allow for this uh, street closure for Holy Rosary. There's a motion, is there a second? Second. There's a second. Any discussion? Just Which, for clarification, what, what are they looking to close? All the way around the lake or what mm, portion? It says here, south on Washington Avenue, left on North Shore Drive by the park, right on to the North Shore Drive by the high school, around Big Detroit Lake, <laughs> around Little Detroit Lake, back along West Lake Drive, north on Lake Avenue, back to Holy Rosary School. It's going to be on October 17th from 1 to 4 o'clock. Exactly. So everybody out and about watch for for their bike, walk, or run near the pond. Okay, so, okay, Dan? They usually don't close the street. No. They don't actually close no. the street. They don't actually close the street. So it's more of an event, an event uh, yeah. permission, not yeah. closing. They just, yeah. they just have to fill out the application yeah. for it. Though. Right, yeah. right. I just want to make sure that we've it, got it's, the yeah, ability. It's no, what they've not, always have we're done. We're not closing all those streets. Okay. We're, we're doing what we've always done to help them for the marathon, yes. Okay, if no other questions, all in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. The uh, next item, please. Uh, the next item was an application uh, for a food truck license in town that didn't make it into the agenda. This is for a uh, food truck for Brad Shervine, um, DL Dinner and Lunch Food Vendor. Public Works um, approves this. He has his, his fees in and all is well. Motion the second is for a food truck a vendor license at uh, uh, end of North Washington and Highway 34. Uh, any further discussion on that? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. And at this time we're going to take a 10 minute recess. <laughs> uh, we'll go into the finance. The uh, first item is 7A and we had discussion and updates regarding the American Rescue Plan Act, and I'm going to call on Heidi to give us an update on that. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Zeman. Um, at the Finance Committee, we discussed the American Rescue Plan Act funding, um, and I just gave a brief update, which I'll do now. Um, basically, not a lot has changed. There's still no final guidance from um, Department of Treasury on how these funds can be used. However, there is internal there is interim final guidance, um, which has been issued and which uh, some folks are relying on in order to begin spending their funds. Um, we've come up with a few ideas of how we might want to potentially spend these funds, um, run them by some of our financial consultants, our auditors, um, and at, at this point we haven't made any decisions on anything. Um, there'll be more to come on that and many more discussions uh, with the Finance Committee regarding use of these funds. Uh, fortunately, we have plenty of time to spend them. Um, the, the funds need to be encumbered by the end of 2024 and need to be actually spent by the end of 2026. So there's no real rush in, in trying to determine how we're going to spend these. We can wait for some additional guidance if we'd like to. Um, the only other update is that um, Non-entitlement units, which the city is considered because we're under 50,000 uh, 50, population. Um, the first reporting deadline was to be uh, October 31st of 2021, so in a couple of weeks. However, that has now been moved by the Department of Treasury to the end of April 2022. So no reporting is due for us until the end of April, and I think that's for Treasury to get a few quirks worked out of their reporting system that they potentially had with some of their entitlement units um, when they were required to report at the end of August. That is all I have for an update, but I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Okay, any questions for Heidi? If not, thank you very much for that update. Uh, we'll move on to uh, 7E. Heidi, if you can just tell us how we're doing with our different uh, funds and so forth over the summer months to see if our summer seasons are coming back the way we, we're used to having them. 
Sure, absolutely. Um, I did provide the finance committee and I also emailed out earlier to the entire council some updated uh, food and beverage and local option sales tax reports that include final July 2021 figures. Um, the good news here for food and beverage tax, the July 2021 collections were more than any other year. So very good news um, to see the food and beverage industry uh, seeming to bounce back a bit from the pandemic. Um, local option sales tax also has remained strong. Um, again, we're projecting paying off the police department bonds, which were issued only last year. Um, in May of 2023, uh, that's versus our original payoff date, which was February of 2028. So that's four years and nine months early, um, and which yields an extra savings of over $163,800 in interest payments that we would have um, had to make on, the, on, the, on those bonds. So very good news there. The liquor store, um, obviously a little difficult to compete with 2020 and the nutty year that was last year, but uh, still extremely busy and strong <laughs> over there. Uh, September was nearly 131,000 over their 2019 sales. So still extremely, um, extremely strong sales at the, at the liquor store. Um, and then just on a side note, the liquor fund does transfer a large chunk of their profits to offset property tax levy, um, about $540,000. So just something to keep in mind. Um, the other item that um, I thought I'd give you an update on that we don't necessarily always update on is lodging tax. Um, good news here too, it does appear that the lodging um, industry has bounced back uh, some as well. In June, July, and August, we received lodging tax receipts, um, more lodging tax receipts than we've ever received since since those have been put in place. So um, overall, the, the summer was quite good to our, our lodging establishments, which is, which is good to hear, especially after last year. Um, and then looking at January through August 2021 versus 2019, uh, we're actually over where we were at in 2019 by about $4,200 in lodging tax collections. So um, again, bouncing back and that is all good news for our businesses. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Otherwise, that's all I have. Any questions for Heidi? If not, it looks like uh, the businesses in the Trail Lakes area are, are doing well and we've got our resort season back and strong with June, July and August and it also goes into September too. So. Uh, hopefully that trend will continue all the way through winter for us. Thank you for that update. We need That's a motion. We need to get off the consent. Okay, we need need a motion to go ahead and accept that report. So moved. A second. Second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Glory. Uh, let's go on to uh, the Public Safety Committee. Thank you, Ron. Uh, item A is. Uh, consideration to approving the revised civil service rules and regulations. Uh, the proposed change here is to uh, make a change from allowing summer help, summer only temporary help to allowing part-time uh, uh, police officers any time of the year. The rules are in the agenda packet, public safety committee recommended approval and I so move. Second. There's a motion, is there a second? Is there any discussion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. So item B will also require approval. Um, we did get our new ladder truck. The chief reported that it is wonderful, exceeds expectations. So now we need to get rid of the old ladder truck, but uh, we need approval from the council to uh, sell that uh, public safety committee uh, moves to um, approve selling the old ladder truck and I so move. There's a motion, we got a second then. Uh, is there any discussion in regards to that? Is there any interest from Becker County Museum? <laughs> <laughs> We're looking for... Not that truck. Not that truck, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, but maybe the water carnival can make the parade longer. <laughs> <laughs> We have is, the most fire trucks anybody in the area. 
<laughs> is, is there much of any value because it is in its broken state? Gee, Swanson, how much do you think we could probably get? Part of that. We don't want to probably skew uh, that uh, in a we're public we're gonna, we're session. But anyway, one million dollars. It does has value, and you and we certainly don't want to give it away. The latter, the latter part doesn't work, but there are other features on it. You know, the truck does run it. Its pump has been rebuilt, so somebody could use it to some extent, or maybe you could get by if you only used, you know, needed it. Uh, once every few years, you, you just had to have a ladder uh, truck in reserve, and you wanted to baby that ladder one time, uh, very seldom. But uh, so there is some value. You could probably part it out if nothing else. But um, keep it as a grass rig, maybe. So well, we yeah, <laughs> we don't need a grass rig that big. You put it in your yard for <laughs> so, display. <laughs> so, but uh, but we will have to do um, full disclosure of what's wrong with the latter part of it. Um, you know, make sure whoever gets it knows what what its uh, liabilities are. So and we advertise. So do we? So we got a motion a second to put it up for sale. To take a vote. All in favor of going ahead with that? Say aye. 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 Oppose. That motion carries. <clears throat> Let's move on to the. Uh, liquor and Gambling Committee, uh, Matt Volke. Uh, item 9A was discussion on a special on-sale liquor license. Uh, this has been deferred as we're looking for more information and possibly a presentation next month, so no action there. Uh, there is another agenda item. Uh, item 9B was the donation uh, to the Ice Palace. Uh, Kelsey, you want to tee that one up? Sure. Vice Mayor and Council, uh, Last month, the Liquor and Gambling Committee meeting, we talked a little bit about where the budget sits for our 150th event. Um, we kind of wanted to get through the Heritage Festival and see where we ended up after that event. Uh, basically, the last kind of scheduled event that we have is the Ice Palace and Polar Fest. So there was a request from the Ice Palace to contribute um, towards the, uh, the lighting of the trees in the park. Um, that was discussed a little bit last month. Um, we also typically give something f to Polar Fest for fireworks, so we anticipate there'll be a request for that next year. So basically the discussion at the Liquor and Gambling Committee was around uh, how much to uh, sponsor, basically or contribute to the um, Ice Palace and the lighting in the park. After discussion at the uh, Liquor and Gambling, uh, we decided on an amount of $6,750 uh, for kind of a, a one-time gift. Uh, I'd make a motion to approve. Okay, there's a motion for $6,750 to be used for this uh, expense. There's a second? Yep. Okay, the second. And, and I'm, I might add too that the, this Polar Fest is gonna be quite a deal this year with the, with the Ice Palace. It's gonna be their final event for the 150th celebration. In the past, the ice palace has been made up of a thousand blocks of ice, and their goal right now that they're planning is to have two thousand blocks of ice. So it's it's not going to be just a little little ice palace. It's going to be huge. So uh, anyway, uh, we've got a motion, a second, and all in favor of spending six thousand seven hundred fifty dollars. Liquor fund, say aye. 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 Opposed. That motion carries. And then uh, going on here. Uh, We also are going to call on Natalie to do uh, item 11A, please. Well, this falls under finance, but Kelsey can speak on this better than I can. <laughs> you want me to speak to it? Um, Vice Mayor and Council, uh, the Airport Commission has already approved this. Uh, the airport received a grant to pay 70% of the design costs related to the site prep for the new hangar. Um, so basically, this resolution would just authorize the execution of that grant. So with that, uh, finance moves to the consideration to a resolution authorizing the execution of the MnDOT grant agreement for the hangar site prep design. Second. Okay. Motion to second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carries. We're going to uh, skip 11B uh, for right now, but we're going to go to uh, item uh, uh, C, uh, consideration approve the following licenses. and. Can I do those all of these? Those are on consent. Those are on consent. So we've got that squared away then, so we're yep. good there. 
Under the mayor's agenda, uh, we, uh, he'd like to recommend the name <coughs> of Reverend Ernie Mancini to replace the board member, Carrie Johnson, who served her term on the HRA board. Uh, is there a motion to accept Reverend Ernie Mancini to be on the HRA board? So moved. Is second. there a second? There's a second. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, opposed. That, that motion carries. And then uh, going on down here, uh, I want to mention that on, on the, our next council meetings on uh, December 14, 2021, in our December meeting, we have that truth and uh, tax levy pursuant to the truth taxation inquiry about 6.01 p.m. And then also to remind everybody that we have a special council meeting that will be held on Wednesday, October 20th at 1 p.m. And we need everybody here to please uh, be here for that meeting. That's next Wednesday, October 20th at 1 p.m. And also just a reminder that the Coalition of Greater Minnesota, Minnesota Fall uh, Conference is taking place uh, in Wilmer on November 18th and 19th. We do have a block of rooms. So if you're interested, please uh, see Glory so we can get your name in there for those reservations. And with that, uh, before we adjourn, uh, staff, do you have anything you'd like to bring up at this time before we do the item 11B? I, no, I do not have anything else. That. Okay, does anybody else on the council have anything else they would like to bring up this time before we do item 11B? At this time, we're going to close our regular meeting and have a closed meeting for consideration of the monetary contribution by the city to the purchase of the right of way for the Westlake Drive project. Uh, this meeting may be closed pursuant to Minnesota Statute 13D.05 subdivision uh, 3C. So at this time, we'll uh, adjourn our meeting for a closed meeting.